The M1 Max MacBook Pro with 32 GPU cores is being labeled as one of the strongest Macs Apple has released. Well, I wanted to see how it performs against a fully specced out 2020 desktop iMac. Today, I'll be comparing the last and fastest Intel iMac against the fastest 16 inch M1 Max MacBook Pro and testing them specifically for video editing, putting them through tons of real world tests with not a single one being a benchmark. I'll be doing playback, scrubbing and render tests using multiple video codecs and frame rates, export tests, tests with simple timelines, as well as complicated timelines loaded with tons of effects, then finishing off with stabilization, color grade and transcode tests. Before we begin, here are the full specs for each Mac. The iMac comes in at $4,900 USD, with the 16-inch M1 Max MacBook Pro costing a good chunk less at $3,500. First test is playback quality in a 4K timeline with 4K footage. Both the M1 Max and the iMac have no issues playing back this H.265 video in 24 frames per second, 60, and 120 FPS with the zero drop frames. Next codec is H.264, which is less compressed. Both Macs play back 24 FPS just fine, but the iMac drops frames after a couple seconds for 60 FPS and drops after only a second for 120 FPS, with the M1 Max having no trouble playing both. The least compressed codec all intra, all frame rates play smoothly for both the M1 Max and iMac. Next test is scrubbing performance with the same codecs and frame rates. H.265 at 24 FPS scrubs quite a bit better on the M1 Max for 24 FPS, 60 FPS is the same, and once again 120 FPS, the iMac scrubs quite a bit worse than the M1 Max. H.264 is basically the same as H.265 in 24, 60, and especially 120 FPS. All intra plays back completely buttery smooth on both the M1 Max and the iMac, with no drop frames in scrubbing for all the frame rates. Test number three is working in a real project that's loaded with tons of effects. The A-Roll is an easier to process codec. H.265, 420, 4K, 24 FPS, and 50 megabits per second. First test in this project is simply rendering the A-Roll timeline with all native and third-party effects disabled. This project is 18 minutes and 50 seconds long. The M1 Max MacBook Pro is able to complete the render on a 4K timeline in 2 minutes and 42 seconds, or 2.7 minutes. And the iMac was twice as long at 5.23 minutes. On a 1080 timeline, the same A-Roll render was 1.32 minutes on the M1 Max and 2.87 minutes on the iMac. This test is the big one, render and export of the entire project with all effects enabled, and there's a lot of them. The M1 Max completed the render with a 4K timeline in 21.82 minutes, and the iMac was surprisingly a little faster at 19.37 minutes. Exporting the rendered project took the M1 Max 52.85 minutes, and once again the iMac was faster at 47.33 minutes. On a 1080 timeline, things were quite a bit faster for both Macs. The M1 Max rendered the full project in 13.02 minutes, and this time the iMac was slower at 16.17 minutes. The M1 Max exported the entire project in 29.15 minutes, and unfortunately I couldn't get a time on the iMac due to it crashing every time I tried to export it. This occurred several times when I was actually trying to export the video to upload to YouTube, and then again during these time tests, and after the fifth time I just had to move on. Export and render times are a good metric to gauge performance, but I wanted to see how good playback performance is in a massive project when nothing is rendered, basically what it would be like when you're actively editing. This is still a 4K timeline with better quality playback on, and going from a 6 to a 10 effect stack. Starting from 1.16.10, the M1 Max plays until 1.22.01 before it drops frames, while the iMac drops at the exact same time. Switching the timeline to better performance though, both Macs can play through the effect stack without dropping any frames. Better performance mode reduces the image quality of the source video to I believe 25%. The next effect stack is even heftier, going from 1 effect to 17 in quality playback. Starting at 10.51.10, the M1 Max drops frames at 11.01.21, while the iMac drops shortly after at 11.02.02. Once again switching to performance playback, the M1 Max can play the entire 17 stack, but the iMac drops frames unless I drop one of the effects to 16 stack, at which point it can play through. As I mentioned, those tests were with an unrendered timeline, so what happens when the section is pre-rendered with the 4K timeline with better quality playback? In this case, both the Macs play back with no drop frames in the first and second example. I switched the timeline to 1080 to see if it would boost performance. 
The M1 Max in the first example played for half a second longer and stopped at 122.13, and also for a half a second longer in the second example, dropping frames at 11.02.07. The iMac had a slight improvement playing for two seconds longer to 124.01 in the first example, and about a second longer in the second example to 11.03.11. .11. So I'd say the iMac performed slightly better overall. The final test I wanted to do in this complicated project is the time it takes to render just one effect in the 17 stack. I know when I'm creating these videos and I just wanna do something simple like change the duration of an effect, it's a pain when it takes forever to render just that one tiny change. The way this test works is I rendered the entire 17 stack, then I extend just one effect by 14, 20 seconds. I start the timer when I re-render the effect stack. In a 4K timeline, the M1 Max took 4.62 minutes, while the iMac was a speedy 1.73 minutes. Reducing the effect stack to just a more reasonable 7 stack, the M1 Max took 3.58 minutes to render, while the iMac was faster again at 1.32 minutes. Unfortunately, I returned the M1 Max prior to seeing these results, but there were a couple times while testing the M1 Max and the M1 Pro in a different video where they had pretty different render and export times for the exact same test. And based off some of the results I later found, I think the M1 Max could have finished the 4K 17 stack render in about 2.02 minutes and the 7 stack in around 1.48 minutes. For the 1080 versions of the renders, the M1 Max performed much better, with the 17 stack render being completed in 1.78 minutes and the iMac being 1.53 minutes. The 1087 stack render was 1.23 minutes on the M1 Max and 1.07 minutes on the iMac. Next test is going back to those codec and frame rate example shots, this time with some render and export tests. For the 24 FPS 5 minute talking head clip, I applied 120 magnification, as without it there would be nothing to render. All these tests will be in a 4K timeline, with the exception of just one 1080 timeline test to compare at the end. I would first test the export of the unrendered 24 FPS project, then time the rendering, and finally time exporting the project again once it had been rendered. For the 1 minute 60 and 120 FPS clips, I would slow down the footage to 40 and 20% respectively, and time how long it took to render the slow motion then time the export. H265, five minute, 24 FPS, the unrendered export was 5.67 minutes on the M1 Max and 5.7 minutes on the iMac. Rendering the 120X magnification was blazing fast for the M1 Max, taking only 41 seconds, while the iMac was significantly slower at 3.08 minutes. Exporting the rendered clip had basically no improvement for the M1 Max, 5.63 minutes, but the iMac did improve when exporting a rendered clip versus unrendered clip, taking 4.1 minutes. H265, 60 FPS slow to 40% was 22 seconds for the M1 Max, and the iMac was 1.68 minutes. For the export of the 60 FPS rendered clip, the M1 Max was quite a bit slower at 2.97 minutes, and the iMac was faster at 2.12 minutes. Lastly, for H265, 120 FPS slow to 20%, the render time for the M1 Max was 40 seconds and 2.95 minutes on the iMac. Export time for the 120 FPS clip was 5.88 minutes for the M1 Max, and the iMac was once again quite a bit faster at 4.18 minutes. Here are the rest of the times for the other codecs and frame rates. A general theme is that the M1 Max can render things significantly faster than the iMac, but the iMac pulls ahead in export times. As I mentioned earlier, I wanted to do just one test in a 1080 timeline to see how much faster things were compared to a 4K timeline. I used the same H265, 24 FPS, five minute talking head clip and did the same round of tests. The M1 Max completed the unrendered export in 1.57 minutes, while the iMac was very slow at 4.52 minutes. Rendering the 120X magnification was 33 seconds for the M1 Max and 2.45 minutes on the iMac and lastly, exporting the render timeline was 1.55 minutes on the M1 Max, and the iMac was significantly faster than its unrendered export, coming in at 1.25 minutes. Moving on to stabilization using the same 60 and 120 FPS clips from earlier. For these tests, I turned on auto render, so as soon as the stabilization transcode was complete, it would start rendering the stabilization immediately. I kept the clips at full speed though, so there's no rendering power being used for the slow motion. For H265 60 FPS, the M1 Max took 1.2 minutes to stabilize, and the iMac took 2.27 minutes. For the 120 FPS stabilized clip, the M1 Max was 2 minutes, and the iMac was very slow at 6.22 minutes. The stabilization and renders were very similar for the other codecs. The M1 Max was always faster, but the iMac especially had a hard time with the 120 FPS clips. 
Next test is fun. It's another effects test to see how many I can stack before we drop frames, but in a much more controlled scenario. This one, I have effects starting at evenly spaced intervals to see how big the stack can go. I used a simple line animation from a third-party plugin that I stacked every 0.5 seconds. For a 4K unrendered timeline and quality playback, the M1 Max could handle 20 lines before drop frames, while the iMac could take quite a bit more at 42 lines. Changing to performance playback, the M1 Max could play the entire 60 line stack without dropping frames, but now the iMac could only get up to 46 lines. Changing the timeline to 1080 and quality playback, the M1 Max improved quite a bit and got to 58 lines, and the iMac had a marginal improvement to 47 lines. For 1080 and performance playback, the M1 Max could once again handle 60 lines, but the iMac could only do 48 lines. Next test is another full project, but this time a much simpler one with mainly native text effects and much smaller stacks. The A-roll is the same easy codec as before, H.265, but now it's double the bitrate at 100 megabits per second. Rendering just the 4K timeline, which is 9.28 minutes, with no effects active took the M1 Max 1.32 minutes, and the iMac 2.52 minutes. Rendering the entire project with all effects active took the M1 Max 1.93 minutes, and the iMac 3.28 minutes. You can see how much faster things can render out when there's minimal native effects versus the extremely large effects stacks plus third-party plugins that I was testing earlier. Finally, exporting the full project took the M1 Max quite a bit longer than the renders at 10.47 minutes, and the iMac was quite a bit faster at 7.65 minutes. I repeated the tests on a 1080 timeline, and here are the results. Times were overall faster for both Macs, but the M1 Max is still rendering faster than the iMac, and the iMac is exporting faster than the M1 Max. All right, on to our second last test, color grading. I took the five minute H.265 clip from earlier and I stacked 15 adjustment layers with Final Cut Pro native color adjustments. Both the M1 Max and the iMac are able to get to the top of the FX stack with zero drop frames. The second half of the color grade test is just rendering the entire five minute clip with less intense color adjustments, but still pushing the global, shadows, highlights, and midtones as well as temperature and hue, and adding some color adjustments in Color Finale as well as a LUT, so quite a few things. The M1 Max finishes the render in a solid 1.62 minutes, and the iMac is over two times slower, taking 3.55 minutes to render the color correction. Last and final test, transcoding to optimize and proxy media. Once again, I did this for the various codecs and frame rates from earlier. I wanted to see how long it took to transcode all three frame rates for each codec. For H.265, transcoding 24, 60 and 120 FPS to optimize took the M1 Max 1.28 minutes, beating the iMac by the biggest margin so far, with the iMac taking 7.52 minutes. Transcoding proxy 50% took the M1 Max 42 seconds and the iMac 2.08 minutes. As you can see for H.264 and the all intra codec, the Max performed the same with the M1 Max beating the iMac in every single test. However, the iMac seemed to be particularly slow when transcoding optimized, with proxy 50% having a smaller gap between the M1 Max and the iMac. These results are interesting, but I wanted to see how fast transcode times were when I put the Max under longer sustained transcoding loads. To test this, I transcoded a freelance project I did. It consists of 13 minutes of footage over 56 clips, mostly in 120 FPS with some in 60 FPS. All shot in H.265, 4K, and the highest bitrate possible being 150 and 200 megabits per second. Once again, the M1 Max takes a decisive win transcoding the project to optimize in 5.47 minutes and proxy in 3.05 minutes. The iMac was three times slower completing optimized in 17.08 minutes and proxy in 9.12 minutes. And finally, for the very last test, I transcoded a full talking head clip that's just like this. The clip is H.265 and 35 minutes long. The M1 Max transcoded optimized in 3.1 minutes and proxy in 1.82 minutes. And the iMac had similar results to before, completing optimized in 10.02 minutes and proxy in 5.57 minutes. So is the M1 Max as powerful as you thought it would be? It's definitely a fast computer and the fact that it's a laptop, being able to compete against a desktop computer, all the while staying completely silent and generally cool is crazy. And it's exciting to see what the chip variation will look like in an M1 desktop Mac. Until then though, as you could see, the Intel iMac was still able to beat up the M1 Max in a good chunk of tests. If you're interested in seeing how other Macs performed, I've also compared the M1 Max to the base 16 inch M1 Pro MacBook Pro, as well as the iMac to the original 13 inch M1 MacBook Pro. If you have any questions, leave them in the comments below and I'll get back to you within a few hours. Thank you very much for watching and I hope you have a great day. Take care.